really great attendance. Um, today, Professor Zalberger is going to be speaking on the rationality of numbers, I guess, or maybe people. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and um, also, I wanted to mention that next week, uh, Professor uh, Kiesling is going to be speaking on Smale's seventh problem. So I guess that will have a, a big uh, geometric flavor. So for any people interested in geometry, and even if you're not, you should come, and, and it's going to be a good talk. And we're expecting Professor Beck to speak the week after that. Uh, also, I wanted to mention, although it's not um, uh, this seminar, the number theory seminar tomorrow, our own Pedro uh, Pontes is going to be speaking on the Bateman Horn conjecture, which is uh, uh, actually a hugely important conjecture, which um, will imply the uh, uh, asymptotic formula for twin primes and things like that. And, and he's going to give us the uh, almost proof of it, I guess. So that'll be exciting to, to hear. So everyone that come to that too. So, and we've got uh, cookies for everyone over here, so please help yourself. Thank you. And thank you for John for doing such a good job in organizing, and hopefully this seminar will revive and have decent attendance continue. Uh, so the emphasis now in this new incarnation of the seminar is open problems. Uh, once a theorem is proven, it's no longer interested. interesting. <laughs> Somebody has proven it, it's really dead. So open problems is what's interesting. So we want to emphasize in this seminar open problems. And I will talk about some of my open problems. My favorite open problems are those that are easy to state, but impossible of the proof. Hopefully not impossible, impossible, because you have the dream of one day proving them. Uh, but uh, hard enough. So I chose as my topic uh, irrationality. And irrationality, as John Lenson, has several meanings. In game theory, we talk about rational agents, people who behave rationally. And in economics, people realized about 40 years ago that the standard model of economics, the assumption that people are rational, people are smart, they do the best behavior is completely wrong. Most humans are not rational. And there's a whole thing in economics called bounded rationality or even non-rationality, trying to model real behavior of real people who are not necessarily the perfect agent of economics. That's why most of economics is completely nonsense. Interesting nonsense, but <laughs> not relevant to the real world. And indeed, irrationality first thought was the same root as imaginary. People thought it was crazy. And indeed, a long, long time ago, in ancient Greeks, uh, Pythagoras had a religion. He was the prophet the, of a religion of numbers. Everything is numbers. And by numbers, he meant integers. So he knew that sometimes we have to divide. So for example, two over three is not an integer, but still, okay. So everything is either an integer or a ratio of integers. And then there was a big crisis. Some wise guy called Hippasus realized that the square root of two cannot be written as a ratio of two integers. There is no way in which you can write the square root of two as a ratio of two integers. And I'm sure you all know the proof. Uh, the, but uh, the proof uh, I prepared, uh, oops, uh, uh, this is a beautiful poem uh, made. Uh, my former colleague, uh, that Wimp, made into a beautiful, a beautiful, Point. So let me go to my office and get it. And, and while this, please uh, have a pop quiz. Uh, prove it yourself. Uh, <laughs> the score of two is rational. Everybody does it. I think one yeah, yeah, yeah. 
irrational. Yeah. So the student went through all the steps and then concluded at the end, you know, copying with the square two of it. And you included at the end, square two of it. <laughs> and so that's a, a beautiful poem that I want to give out. Uh, the, the, proof, the classical proof of Scott of Two, that I'm sure I know, uh, has been, uh, uh, been made into a poem. So it's a two column uh, poem, and let me read it. The square root of two is rational, to be done in a white room. It's kind of white. <laughs> so it's two columns. So let me first read the left column. By contradiction, assume that the square root of two equals m over n. <coughs> and n have no common factors. So 2 equals m squared over n squared. Or 2m squared equals m squared. This is a mathematical column. And then the point the poetry column is on the, uh, on the right side. An N person stands beneath an M person. They are not both carrying two oranges. If so, cancel the oranges. From here on, you must accept anyone either carries two oranges or else makes magic. If M is a magician, her square is foot free. So M equals. <laughs> A 2p, and so on. And then it goes on. Now M and N retire. They were unwell. At dawn, dressed as flies, they were forced to undergo a mock execution. In fact, they balanced each other badly, long hair tangling their feet. Question them. They evade and shift their hands, hidden behind their backs, burned with the scent of rind. See, see, see. The true wizard is, but cannot be seen in this white room. Pythagoras, his spirit holds sway. So this was the big, big trauma of the Pythagorean. And Hippasos was not very nice. Uh, he gave it away to the outside world. And uh, they were very mad at him. And according to some versions, he was excommunicated. Other versions, uh, he was drowned. Uh, but, uh, because he gave away the secret. Because they were sure that it's only an apparent paradox, and very soon they resolve it. Uh, so uh, it was premature of, them to, uh, of him to give it away. Uh, but in my philosophy, he, Pythagoras was right after all. The statement, the square root of two, is irrational, uh, is wrong. Everything is a rational number. But the proof, the spirit of two, does not exist. So the classical proof that the spirit of two is rational, in my philosophy, the spirit of two does not exist. But you can justify it. And by the way, the usual proof is not my favorite proof. I have a much better proof, it was mine, but it's much better. So, if you simplify, <coughs> We really have to prove that it's impossible to solve the following Diophantine equation. Lots of very difficult problems in number theory are Diophantine equations. So we really want to prove that there are no solutions in integers of these Diophantine equations. So the usual proof is at this point, I'm sure you know, I won't repeat it. But it uses the multiplicative structure of integers. So a much better, much better proof is a reduction formula. <coughs> I claim if A comma B is a solution of this equation, I can come up with another solution. 2B minus A comma A minus B. So that's the lemma. Suppose that A and B are positive integers, and of course A is bigger than B, because A squared is 2B squared, then 
this is also, this is a routine verification. Just plug like in, if you call A prime and A bar equals 2B minus A, and <coughs> B bar A minus B, I leave it to you, to the reader, to the listener, A squared minus 2B squared is minus A squared minus 2B squared. In particular, if this is zero, this must be zero. But notice, this is A plus B. And here the sum of these two numbers is 2B minus A is B. And <coughs> it has an A. So if you define the size of a pair to be the sum of the two positive integers for everything, suppose I would have had a solution, I would come up with a smaller solution whose sum is less. And eventually you go to 2 comma 1. So if there would have been something in the zillion, zillion, zillions, so over later you can come to the smallest possible such pair, a bigger than p positive integers. And now plug it in. 4 equals 2. No, QED. So this is a much better proof, in my opinion. Because it indicates how I'm sure many other Delphitan equations would one day be solved and only be done with something like this. Not so simple. For example, Fermatian theorem. Andrew Wilde had to sit in the attic for seven years trying to prove uh, the so-called Fermatian theorem with a not solution of this Delphine equation. So here we have two uh, integers and here we have three, uh, four integers and bigger than two. Prove that they do not exist positive integers a, b, and c and n bigger than two such as this. I'm sure that there exists a simple, routinely provable reduction formula. You define f of n, a, b, and c. Define this to be f of n, a, b, and c. And you find for such a hypothetical solution, there is another solution, a prime, b prime, c prime, n prime. <coughs> and somehow you have to use that n is bigger than 2. <laughs> or else you get in big trouble. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, so far nobody found it. But now with computers, you can do a systematic search for such reduction formula, and then you would have at least a conceptual one and proof of our master theorem. And I'm sure that all this heavy machinery, the Langmix program, and all this is very nice. Uh, but you don't really need it. It's a big red herring, and one day uh, there will be problem. Because now there is a new game in town. We have computers. Computers are so powerful, and there's so much that we can do with computers. Classical number theory and all mathematics have been developed without computers. You did a very good job. It's amazing what you did with our computers. I'm very, very impressed. Uh, Gauss and Euler and Ramanujan are really terrific, terrific guys. It's amazing what they did. It's amazing how the ancient Egyptians built these beautiful pyramids without uh, modern technology. And uh, it is very, very impressive. But still, the pyramids in Egypt would have been much, much higher if they had uh, today's uh, technology. So what we have to do is back to that. Go back to the 17th century, look at what they did, and do it all over with computers. And today, I want to outline my approach for being famous. So I mentioned in the abstract that E plus pi is not known to be a, a rational or not. It's an open problem whether E plus pi is irrational. This is stupid. Whoever says that it's not known whether E plus pi is rational is very, very stupid. <laughs> e plus pi is irrational. Why should it be? Why should it be? There's no reason why it should be. So I have a probabilistic proof that E plus pi and <laughs> E plus pi and many, many other things. And another big open problem is gamma. All is constant. Let me remind you all is constant. 
uh, if you have the famous harmonic series. As you know, it diverges. <coughs> but if you take away the log natural of capital N and you take the limit as N goes to infinity, it's not the best way to, com to compute in a computer. As you know, this is very, very slowly convergent. But if you do it patient enough, you get it. It's amazing that Euler is called Euler's constant. Euler computed it to 10 decimal digits completely by hand. Because he invented for this purpose possibly is the Euler McLaurin formula. And with the Euler McLaurin formula, it's amazing how he was able to compute it to 10 decimal digits. Today we can easily compute it to 10 million uh, digits. <coughs> and uh, nobody can prove that this. But why are the maths they all be irrational? Because how many rational numbers are they? Alex zero. They're countable. How many real numbers are they? Alex. So this is a very, very, very small zero. So the probability that if we take a random real number and, uh, and that it be rational is so small. So probability proof. <laughs> so this is why it's a stupid question, because it's obviously true. So it's just an artificial game mathematician play to find a formal proof. It's a nice game, but nothing to do with truths. It's just, and people claim mathematicians who care about the truth, but not, they don't care about the truth. They have their own, like chess, chess players, do they care about winning wars? No, they have this nice game, they have this convention, they play the games, and they don't care about, uh, uh, about fighting wars. Uh, it's just a, a game. So, formal proof is that the game, and uh, a fun game sometimes, uh, Proof is nice. Sometimes it's uh, not a fun game, and the proof is ugly, uh, and sometimes it's not worth the effort. Uh, so many proofs are so ugly, and that's to play this game uh, to get a form of proof as far as the truth value, it doesn't contribute anything. There are so many statements that are obviously true, so it's really stupid. Uh, so if the proof is ugly, it's not worth doing. It's better to do something else. Also, in some sense, the question still open. You'll be very, very famous if you can prove it E plus pi. Because it's a game. So it's, it's fair to, uh, to reward uh, uh, this. But in another sense, why it's a stupid question? Because you're mixing apples and oranges. The definition of E, as you know, is sigma 1 of n factorial n goes from 0. That's one definition. Definition of pi, one of them. Uh, due to Leibniz and, and <coughs> these infinite series have nothing to do with the notion of ratio. So uh, it's really mixing apples and oranges the, uh, and also the more general transcendent transcendence problem, where there exists algebra and equation, also is completely. So in some sense, these problems are really artificial. First, they're obviously true. So as far as knowing the truth, it's completely useless. And also, from a conceptual point of view, it's a stupid question. But it's still challenging, because it's so hard. And even though this problem, this fact is obviously true, and it's a stupid artificial question. I still love to prove it. Because I'm famed. I love to be famous, and, <laughs> and that's my best hope. <laughs> to give my hypothesis, my probability of proving it is 10 to the minus. Maybe Google. <laughs> this, I give my probability 10 to the minus 20. Still small! But much smaller, but probably of proving the Riemann hypothesis. So let me tell you my plan, and uh, you're, you're welcome to try it on your own. If you promise to put me as a collaborator, there is a course, or else I'll be very, very mad at you. How is my plan to prove that E plus pi is irrational? The problem is, you should not be greedy. You should not only focus on one constant at a time. Chemists discover something called combinatorial chemistry. 
the pharmaceutical industry. They just take lots of compounds and find all the combinations. Most of the time they get something useless, but once in a while you get a cure to cancer and then you get a Nobel Prize or get very, very rich. So I like to propose combinatorial uh, number theory, not in the usual sense, but <laughs> in the combinatorial chemistry sense. You'd be also moderately famous if you can prove E plus 3 pi is irrational. Or E over pi. So have a database with billions of entries with the decimal extension of all these numbers one way. And then take things that are obviously a priori irrational. And one way of generating, obviously, uh, irrational numbers is continued fractions. So, uh, 200 years after Pythagoras came a guy called Euclid. Euclid did lots of harm. He founded the axiomatic method that, in my humble opinion, ruined mathematics. It was a dogma of formal proof of axioms of deduction. It made deduct deductive science. Luckily, India and Babylonia and China did not influence right away. So they continued as an empirical science. But Euclid was not all bad. One good thing Euclid did is the Euclidean algorithm. So the Euclidean algorithm. I'm sure you know, is to find the greatest common divisor of two integers, m and n. And how do you do it? You divide m by n. And you have a remainder, r. And you keep doing it. And if you do it, and have the record later, sooner or later, naturally, you can express every fraction as a so-called continued fraction. So, continuous fractions Let's do an example. So, we look at the integer, so it's 1 plus 2 thirds. That's less than 1. So it's equal to 1 plus 1 over 3 over 2. And then you keep doing the Euclidean algorithm. So you have the continuous fraction. So every fraction, every rational number, every cosmos of integers could be written as a finite continued fraction. And the algorithm implies, because it gets smaller and smaller things, uh, it's part of the algorithm, it's an easy exercise, that <coughs> if it's a finite fraction, if it's a, a rational number, it has a finite continued fraction. By the way, simple continued fraction. The, the numerator always has to be, uh, to be one. So it's a simple continued fraction. Conversely, if you have an infinite continued fraction, it's a priori irrational. Because if it were being a rational number, it would have had a finite continued fraction. So here is how a much better way, even better proof. So so far I mentioned two proofs of storage two. I have yet another better one. Go to Maple and convert it to floating point. And Maple had the command convert convert uh, blah 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 to a construct. That's the command. So all you have to do, so you to set digits, the number of decimal digits that you want. So it's good to do it big, 100. Then you have the default is 10. Then you do a valve. A valve. And you get 
Uh, this is my favorite uh, uh, number. Uh, uh, when I moved to Rutgers uh, about 12 years ago, I was negotiating about my salary. So I wanted to make it uh, mathematically meaningful. Uh, so I asked for 141,400. <laughs> but the dean said that uh, they have a discrete scale and you cannot match exactly, uh, but he got close. So, but uh, he got less and, and, and all that, not, that. <laughs> not, not more in this case, but still. So like, it's fine. Anyway, anyway, go on. What about periodic uh, continuous fractures? They're also infinitely long, huh? but... Yeah, yeah, it's going to be periodic. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, right, uh, let me do it. So if you go to the mainboard, you get the following answer. Uh, in uh, one, that's one over two, that's one over two. So in mainboard notation, it tells you two, 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 two. One, sorry, sorry, one. <laughs> two, two, two. So here's another proof. You go to mainboard and you scare at the screen. You stare, sorry, you stare at the screen and you detect the pattern. And even uh, Michael, uh, for your big, uh, even Michael can detect the pattern. One, two, 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 because an infinite continuous fraction, it's a priori irrational. But you still have to prove it. It's a regulator. Maybe computers cannot prove things. They can just indicate uh, this conjecture uh, for the conventional reason goes. So in this case, uh, let's, uh, let's call y equal to square of 2 minus 1. <laughs> so, so we have y in this. And now you have said similarity. This guy, the guy goes forever, is exactly why. And now you prove that this infinite continuous fraction is equal to the square root of 2 minus 1. You just uh, do it. Get that to my equation. y equals. Uh, sorry. y equals 1 over 2. Uh, class 1 over 1, right? And of course it's positive. Plus 1. Plus one. Oh, sorry. Plus one. The circle there is, is a little bit uh, misplaced. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you have to include the 1 there. Yeah, sorry, sorry. That's okay? I think so. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No. Yeah, this is why. So why is it? So well, just, just include the one no, over the circle. circle. One half plus, and then the circle goes with one over oh, okay. two. And so on. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, exercise. <laughs> you get the right equation. You get the right equation. You can solve it. And you have a form of proof that y equals square root minus 1, and hence x is square root of 2. And you know, another <coughs> solve proof today that the square root of 2 is irrational. So you can go backwards. Jacobi said, one must always invert. <coughs> so it's very, very hard to shoot target shooting as somebody something far away to a target. It's a much better way to first shoot and then draw the bullseye. So this is the approach that you can try to do. So why stop here? You can go and do something much more complicated. One, three, five, three. Anything for you, like I said. A priori, define this. You know it's irrational. Then you get a more complicated algebraic equation, and then you can prove that that thing. But that's already known stuff, old stuff. Uh, it goes back to the Sandor. Uh, that if it's periodic continuous fraction, it's obviously a quadratic irrationality. But going backward is a bit more difficult, but it's a classical theorem of Legendre. So you, can be, you cannot be famous by doing it with only 
and garlic. But here is another big problem. Another proof, a new proof 